Who here is ready to get fully oxidized today? We are going to get extremely rusty. So, my name is James Shockley, and today we are talking about zero to production, how to build a performant SaaS, uh, distributed SaaS, SaaS platform in, uh, in Rust. So, my name is James Shockley. I'm currently a founding engineer at Norello. We are a data access platform who develops cloud APIs, and we use Rust as the primary language for one of our three core planes for our product. Um, for those who are hearing about Rust for the first time, it's a compiled general purpose language, um, which has been voted the most loved language um, by the Stack Overflow Annual Developer Survey for the past six plus years, I think. I would think we're going on past six. Um, so despite that, non-hobbyist perspectives at this kind of um, zero to a product um, aren't they're, they aren't rare, um, but I've had a lot of people ask me about what that experience has been like, and so I propose this talk as an opportunity to, to share that. Um, these slides are available online, and this presentation will end with a link to those. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a College of Charleston alumni of computer science. Um, I was there, while I was there, I was the technical founder of two startups. Um, that was, both of those are interesting stories. I won't be sharing those today. Um, but in short, that was kind of my awakening um, into the startup scene. After that, I was in the German automotive industry doing technology work for about six years um, prior to that. Uh, however, one day I realized that the world was bigger than German automotive industry. Um, and I started doing some freelance and open source on the side to rebuild those chops. And at the beginning of the year, I started with Norello. And this is where the most of my, or the entirety of the experience that I will be sharing um, today here draws from. Um, yeah, when I started, uh, there was no code for what would later become our data plane, um, which is one of our three core planes that we wrote um, with Rust. So um, off of the clock, uh, some of the things that I like to do, I love getting outdoors. Um, if you can guess what distro I use in the following picture, I've got a t-shirt for you, just come up to me afterwards. Um, the answer was Arch, by the way. Um, outside of that, <laughs> Um, yeah, also love getting out snowboarding. Fun fact, Taya from the John's Agreeable Data Talk um, was the one who indeed took this picture. Um, so what are we going to talk about today outside of that? Um, I want to talk about how and why Norello ended up choosing Rust, as well as what that experience is like from a personal as well as a development perspective. And then I want to get a practical demonstration of using Rust, um, going from zero to production for a, a new product um, or project. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I will be introducing some talks during the second part of that concept um, while talking about Rust and what that experience has been like, and we'll show what those mean in practice. Um, so this talk is a few things. It's my personal experience um, with using Rust, and it's a synthesis of resources which I've consumed that have aided in that purpose. Um, some of those which I would like to highlight, and again, there's links to all of these in the slides if you're interested in, one of which is Zero Two Production, an opinionated introduction into backend development. I would recommend this book to anyone trying to really level up. Um, and it is Rust oriented, um, but it teaches you a lot of the day two concepts associated with running production software. Um, again, high Rust orientation here, but it's a really good text. Um, as well as no boilerplate, I really love Triss's fast videos um, that really dive into technical topics. So I learned a lot from the style, um, go check them out. A lot of hacker news and a huge shout out to the Autometrics project as well. So Autometrics is not something that's Rust specific. Their library extends to TypeScript as well as Python as well. Um, but I did have some specific requests that I wanted to incorporate into there in order to showcase them in the demonstration today. And uh, yeah, they were able to support it. So um, big props for being able to integrate with OpenTelemetry Prometheus. Um, also, shout out to the rest of our team as well. Well, um, like Stephanie mentioned, we all have to be curious. We have to encourage curiosity within our team. Um, and I've got to give a huge shout out to the other Rust stations um, that are with us on our team. There's a few things that this talk is not today, though. Um, I don't have a time to give a full introduction to Rust. Um, but I think that Google's in-house training program is absolutely excellent, and it's av available for free. Um, it'll take you about three days if you want to get through the material yourself, but if you're interested in Rust, aside from the Rust book itself, I would, which is a great um, starter utility, I would highly recommend their program too. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to bait the stick and say why you may want to learn Rust, and we're going to skip over the actual implementation, and then I'm going to show you what you can do with it, right? Um, so 
we're going to really skip the coloring here. Um, this talk is also not reflective of my employer. It's not intended to be like a full architectural discussion. But if a talk like that would be interesting to you, feel free to let me know. Um, this also is not advertised. And um, I will be speaking a lot about the context because that experience is inseparable, um, especially when giving um, this talk. So that will, be, that will be a focus here. So without further ado, um, let's get into it. So what were we trying to do? And what were we trying to build when we set out on this journey a couple of months, uh, seven months ago when I joined the team? Um, and that was solving the problem of data access as well as APIs. So you or I, are soft, as software engineers, we understand the importance of data, right? We put a lot of time into activities like modeling data itself, creating your abstract schema, then realizing that schema against your database, like applying migrations, for example, um, as well as realizing access methods against that data. So creating your APIs and then exposing them to the real world and integrating those into your programs so that you can actually interact with them. And then finally, all of this has to be observed as well. Um, so we give observability out of the box for all of those processes that we um, provide, right? And all of this has to be maintained as well. So not only do we help you get started, with data-oriented responsibilities on day one, but we continue to support you on day two. Um, so what does that actually look like in practice, right? I just introduced a bunch of concepts to you, so let's skip ahead to the final product and work backwards from what we ended up building. So here's an example of using um, that schema modeling where you can use a JSON standard format to define your abstract schema, um, and then you can also version that in a way that's familiar to us in a Git-based workflow. Um, then. Of course, you have to have your abstract data model in sync with your databases as well. So we generate those migrations for you if they're necessary, and then we can apply those to your database or you can apply those manually. <coughs> we also generate open API spec compatible um, endpoints for you and then expose those, um, those endpoints as well, right? Those endpoints are exposed um, through query runners, which are running on our data planes. Here's an example of interacting with one of those. Uh, this is a Postman request right now. We're using one of the Open, open API compatible um, endpoints. And then here's an example. Uh, all the light mode users in the room uh, will appreciate this screenshot. So <laughs> switch over to light mode. Um, but here's an example of using observability within our product to understand how your endpoints are actually performing, right? Because um, it's not just about launching them out into the world, it's about seeing if there's regressions in the performance over time. So we give you an all-in-one solution for that. So I've shown you a lot of front-end UI stuff, right? And that doesn't lend itself to Rust very well. So where is the Rust hiding throughout all of this? Here's a big zoom out of what that architecture diagram looks like. So up at the top here, right, we've got that management UI. That's what I've been showing a lot of screenshots about. That's how you actually interact with your application configuration, which is being stored and exposed through a control plane, right? So that basically combines that collection of your schema, which you're defining, um, the endpoints, which will be exposed for that, and it packages all of that into an environment, and then we deploy that and realize it on data planes, right? For each cloud provider, we have a data plane in each major cloud provider region. Um, or if you're a customer and self-hosting things is important to you, you can also self-host it yourself, right? And 100% of Norello's contributed code on that data plane um, is using Rust. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. When I showed that screenshot of that Postman request that was executing one of the open API um, style in REST style endpoints. Um, that was executing against the data plane, right? And we were the client on the left side of this diagram. It was generating the SQL for that, and it was executing it against a, in this case, Postgre data source. Um, though we do also have to support um, Postgre, or MongoDB, um, as well as MySQL as well, um, and others planned for the future. So how do we end up picking uh, Rust for the data plane here? So now that you know a little bit of uh, more about it, let's talk about how we arrived at that, that decision. So we wanted a language that had the following characteristics, right? We wanted one that right off the bat had high baseline performance um, because there's a good rule, well, just to rewind for a second, there's a good rule when it comes to selecting a language or a framework to work with, and that's to pick the one that has the features you need, and if you can have performance, then take it. Um, and that's great when building a widget or a single application, 
but it doesn't hold up as well when you're building a platform to build widgets on, right? Because you have to cater to um, every level, every classification in performance sensitivity that you go up, you eliminate a classification of customers who are sensitive to that level of performance sensitivity. Um, so there's a necessity for baseline performance there. Um, secondly, we wanted something with low performance variability. Um, because ex developers expect their tooling to be extremely stable, um, and we get very frustrated when it's not right. So um, if your APIs are responding in an inconsistent manner, um, that's something that we have to address on our own individually, right? So we definitely, it would not be a selling point to introduce a platform that has a variable profile. Um, and then finally, none of that matters if you don't get your product to market. So you can have the fastest thing in the world, but if you can't finish building it, then none of that really matters. Um, so having something that's easy to work in is, um, is, is a primary requirement here, but it's, it's kind of tough to define as well. Um, and you won't really know if something is good to work in it until you start actually doing so. Um, now, you can also extend that definition of productivity to in define other qualities such as correctness and code quality. So you can have something that's ergonomic to work in um, that is also easy to prove the correctness of your code as well. So let's start out with the first definition to see how Rust fits those baskets. Um, so we're gonna find performance, uh, baseline performance specifically, as for a set of compute resources, how quickly can the same logic be executed relative to under, other languages? And we're not going to be able to, to, to do an exhaustive analysis here, although I've linked two good materials um, that I think have the right methodology for approaching these kind of questions. Um, the first is about efficiency across programming languages, and it measures that using um, factors such as energy um, for performing the same analysis and computations, right? Um, and the second is, I think, a better resource in approaching which framework to choose with a performance orientation in mind. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's, they're totally separate things you know, when you're breaking down which language is more efficient than another and then which frameworks uh, for those um, languages are, are, are more performant and efficient. Um, so basically that left us with the options of C++, Rust, as well as Golang. Um, and eliminated large swaths of uh, other languages. These weren't the only ones, but um, we can only, we only have so much time here, so <laughs> we're limiting it down to these three here. Um, so let's further refine those requirements, right? Um, down to a predictable performance profile. So what I'm gonna show next is the performance profile of the popular gamer dating app Discord. Um, they used Golang behind the scenes and what they found once they got to a certain scale, and mind you, they have far more engineering resources than we do, um, is the following chart in their um, response latencies over time. They saw these regular two minute um, intervals um, with high performance variability, right? They were up against the image of the Golang stop the world style garbage collections, right? And I would really like to revisit this now that Golang has introduced the concept of memory arenas. Um, this was not around at the time um, that we were experimenting um, with what language to use. Um, memory arenas weren't, and I still don't think they're main on Go. I just still don't think they're technically stable, um, although I could be mistaken in that. It's something I would like to revisit, um, but the point still stands is that large companies such as uh, Discord have felt the pain of these invariable or variable performance profiles, um, and that's not something that we wanted to introduce, right? So our results here at this point are now something like analogous to C++ or Rust, your um, traditional compiled languages. Um, so let's talk about that previous point of extending the concept of productivity to developer ergonomics as well as correctness. Because again, it doesn't matter how fast your language is in a vacuum if you can't actually build your product with it. Um, so on that, we'll define correctness as being the ability to express your intent directly um, using code. Or otherwise, is your code actually doing what is specified? Um, and quality is something that's more subjective. So it's a metric um, encompassing maintainability as well as correctness. Um, so quality code must be correct, but not all correct code is high quality. Um, and our tolerance for bugs in our system was nearly zero. Um, so we couldn't pass off the um, burden of incorrect logic to our customers. 
Um, yeah, so basically if, you're, if your data access platform is gaslighting you, you're going to stop using it. Um, so you need to ensure that your, your inputs are, are measuring uh, your outputs, right? Um, that's, uh, that's not kosher otherwise. Um, so we want to encourage correctness and we want to optimize for quality at the same time. Um, and one strategy to do that is test, right? Um, but I want to, and that is, that is still the case, right? But I think also the best tests are those which don't need to be written as well. Um, and Rust does eliminate in the large swaths of type and memory and concurrency related issues, um, meaning that fewer tests need to be written for those certain, those specific scenarios, um, meaning that uh, there is less fatigue, main, less fatigue coming from maintaining those tests which are written. Um, and one way that you can do that is with better syntax, right? Um, so just as types are telling the compiler what data you're working with, um, Rust introduces unique syntax features such as ownership and lifetimes where lifetimes specifically, they tell the compiler when data um, in addition to how types uh, tell the compiler what data. So I'm gonna run through some of those concepts that Rust, Rust introduces extremely quickly um, so that we can uh, then go on to hop into the demo, right? Um, so the first of which is results. Um, this helps to eliminate the billion dollar question or the billion dollar mistake of nulls, right? Um, so rather than interacting with nulls directly, we will use results, which are a wrapper type um, and a num specifically, um, where we can return okay, which is like a, a value that is there, or we can uh, pass back an error which is, communicates the presence or possibility of an error. Whereas with options, uh, we can pass back a wrapper type, which uh, communicates the presence or absence of a value. So, and the reason, just to be going on a more cerebral tangent, is like errors are not an exception, right? They are part of the real world. If you write software that doesn't produce errors, um, you're not writing software that interacts with the real world. Um, so it's important to handle that, uh, those as first class citizens, right? Which Rust does through the uh, error, the um, result, as well as the option enums. Um, okay. And some of the ways you may interact with those is by pattern matching. So you would match against, um, in this case, you can use an enum, you can match against different types. Um, but the default behavior of Rust is to match things exhaustively. Um, and that's pretty powerful. There's, of course, ways that you can get around that and you can take shortcuts, you can provide defaults. Um, but the point is, is that it's very easy to configure your linter to maybe not allow for default behaviors and matching. Um, yeah, as well as ensure that just all of your cases are covered within your program itself. Um, I'm going to skip over ownership as well as borrowing, although these are also like Rust specific concepts. Um, just because they don't have much of a place here and we got to save some time. And I'm going to introduce lifetimes. We're not going to be able to get into them all the way. But um, think of these, think of a lifetime in the concept of this function of longest, right? So we're going to pass in two different string slices to that, which string slices are going to be referenced to a string somewhere in memory. Um, and at compile time, um, the compiler doesn't know which of those handles that it's going to return, right? Um, so we have to tell the compiler, we have to help out the compiler, right? Because with Rust, like, you're working for the compiler now. Um, so we pass in a generic lifetime A here. And we're saying that for both of our parameters, both of these have to live as long as A because our return time, or our return value also has the lifetime of A as well. So it's just a way to express to the compiler that our lifetimes have to live, a or our parameters have to have certain lifetimes, right? They can't go out of scope in the middle of this function call. Um, yeah. So what are some, so that seems like a lot of extra work, right? Let's be frank. So what do we actually get from this? You get it like a culture of correctness within Rust because these things are not painted on to an existing system. These are built in from the start. Um, and one great example that I think, uh, that you get from this is the no panic macro, which you can annotate any function with, and you can prove at compile time that in our case, we've annotated this no demo function with the no panic macro, and we can confirm at compile time that this, uh, this function will never fail. It would not compile if there were a possibility that this function panics, 
um, because we're, we're checking to make sure that all of the execution paths within your code, within your dependencies code, within your dependencies, dependencies, dependencies code um, will not ever panic, right? And y'all just don't have to take my word for this. Um, Google did a really, really extensive study um, teaching thousands of developers within their company Rust and they went on like a six month excursion, um, measuring their code quality and benchmarking that over the next six months, as well as afterwards in their return to work within their respective projects um, outside of that. And the results were phenomenal there. So Rust is extremely productive. Everyone wrote better code. Um, yeah, I'm not sponsored. So, <laughs> so all of these things have value, right? Because it takes time away from us as developers to write additional logic to test against race conditions, right? To test against memory errors. Um, and all of these things have to be maintained, right? So at a certain point, yes, you're writing extra syntax, but you're getting something from it, right? It's not traditional boilerplate. Um, but not everything, is, not everything is green over on the Rust side of things. Um, but there are clear trade-offs, right? And there's no way around it. The compile speed is pretty slow. Um, no way around it. Not particular, like especially compared to Golang and partially compared to C++. Um, but in our biggest uh, code base right now, uh, that compile time is around 15 minutes for like a totally clean build um, for our biggest project. The second thing is that Rust is like unfamiliar. Like I touch on this concepts of ownership and borrowing as well as lifetimes. And I'm, I, unless I'm mistaken, these things are not concepts that exist in other languages, right? Um, so they are unfamiliar and it takes time to get up to speed with these kind of things. However, um, it's not unfamiliarity like what I come back to with JavaScript time and time and time again. I feel like I've learned like four different build systems at this point and it changes like, I feel like I'm getting the carpet pulled out from under my feet. Um, cargo, Rust build system, you only need to learn it once. Lifetimes, you only need to learn it once. Traits, you only need to learn it once. Um, and all of these things have dividends. They will be here 10, 15, 20 years from now, possibly outliving me. Um, so let's put it into practice, right? <laughs> so what I, what I had on the plate for today for a demonstration was to do um, on an authentication service, right? So a lot of reverse proxies um, have this functionality built into it to have a forward auth service, right? Where you're gonna choose a, a specific header or something, you're gonna pass it on to this other service and you're gonna get back a 200 if it's authorized or you know, some 400 series error if it's unauthorized. Um, and so we wanna be able to issue tokens to our database as well as cache them and then validate protected routes, right? And I wanna show off some of these specific features of Rust, right? Uh, this is not a Rust specific feature, but it talks about that culture of correctness and hints at it, right? I wanna show you compile time SQL checking. I wanna show you function level metrics because we wanna go beyond a hello world application. You need to be able to see how your programs behave in the real world, and part of that is observability, right? So we're gonna look at function level metrics as well as HTTP server metrics. Um, and I did not have time for pre-commit testing. So let's skip over to the code. Um, so let's start off in the main here. We're gonna do some basic setup here. Um, we're going to grab some of, also let me start my load tester in the background. So we're using K6 for load testing um, here. Yeah, so we're going to initialize our Prometheus uh, metrics for collection. This is going to be used for open telemetry Prometheus, which is going to hook into our web server framework, which in this case is Actix Web. Um, I have some boilerplate code here if you want to use it for shipping traces as well, but I, I forgot to set up a, a Jaeger instance, so I had nowhere to ship those traces to. Um, we're going to grab our configuration from a YAML file, um, and this configuration holds for us, actually that's not it, that just specifies how to get it. Um, so this just specifies what database we're going to use as well as what cache implementation we're going to use as well. Um, so we're going to build a connection pool for our databases, as well as we're gonna start two separate servers here because I think it's good to host your metrics on a different port than your application. Um, <laughs> so let's look at the startup here now. So we're gonna start both of those different servers, uh, first of which is going to be the metrics, right? So that's pretty simple. We're gonna put our slash metrics route and we're also gonna start our app server. Since we're going to run this on Kubernetes, we're going to need endpoints for our health as well as our readiness, which is going to tell Kubernetes, hey, is our application ready to start receiving requests? Um, can I start delegating requests to it um, from the load balancer, right? 
um, as well as health is like, hey, how is this service doing once it's ready? Um, so from there, we're also going to, to configure it with our authentication service logic, which up here we'll start to get into, right? So our configure your, our auth service, let's go back to the requirements here. We wanted to be able to issue tokens and we wanted to be able to validate them as well. So in order to do that, we're going to need a token database, um, which in this case, we're going to choose a Postgre implementation of that token database. And we're also going to need our cache as well, right? So in this case, we're going to choose a Redis implementation of that cache. We're going to build our auth service with our Redis cache token implement, or Redis token cache implementation, our abstract token cache implementation, um, and Postgre as well. And then we're gonna configure that service, right? So let's skip over to the auth service implementation. Um, so again, we define that as having both a token cache and a token database, right? So let's look into the actual implementations for uh, the functionalities that the auth service is going to provide, which we're going to be able to issue tokens here. We're going to generate that token. We're going to store it in the database. We're going to cache it, right? We're gonna keep that cache hot. And then we're going to return a wrapper. This is our option communicating that we were able to create the token and the value of it, if so. For authentication, similarly simple. Um, we're going to check the cache. If it's there, we're gonna say yeah. Um, otherwise, if it's not, we're going to check for the database and um, in the database, you know, just follow that logic there as well. It should be pretty self-explanatory from here. Looking at the Postgre implementation, two things I wanna highlight here. The first of which is autometrics. So this is one function level annotation because in addition, to the request level metrics that we're collecting via OpenTelemetry Prometheus, which is hooking into our web server framework, we also wanna expose our function level metrics specifically on how long it's taking us to store those tokens, right? Because we wanna see if there's a regression that's happening there over time. So we annotate that with autometrics. And the second thing here is I'm using SQLX. It's not a query builder, it's not an ORM, it's just executing raw SQL. However, we still get features from that. So I'm going to screw up my query string and we get squiggles. Yes, it's not gonna let me compile because this query is not valid. So where SQLX is actually reaching out to the database to um, confirm whether or not this query is actually valid, right? So it will not let me compile. This is just an example of that culture of compile time correctness where we don't have to even write tests for this. We can just uh, rely on SQLX to do that heavy work. Now, we still should, right? Um, but we don't have to. So yeah, so I've already got this running in the background and I've got my K6 load test, which is currently running. Um, and I'm going to switch over to another window where I have Grafana running in the background. Um, okay. And yeah, we can see here up at the top, I've got our endpoint metrics, um, which let me expand this out. And I don't think it's going to get all of this in, okay. Can I specifically select this guy? Okay. Um, but no, but this is for our, our authentication middleware because we're just constantly hitting our validate endpoint with this load test, so I know that this is our validate endpoint. Um, and if I change my time frame, maybe back to the last five minutes, we'll also get our function level metrics here, um, which we annotated with auto metrics. Um, yeah, so that has been it. That has been zero to production, and I think we are exactly on time. So that's it, thank you.